honestly, it's the hallway track. Like the biggest, the spaces where I've learned the most at CPPCon have been in the evenings, hanging out with people over a drink or at dinner and just chatting. Thank you everyone for coming to our talk. Today we're gonna to be talking to you about all the great new features we have in VS Code for C++ developers and all their complex needs from getting started with the language, getting configured, writing those first lines of code to their larger repos where they have more advanced complex debugging and testing needs. Um, but before we get into that, I just wanna quickly introduce ourselves. My name is Sina Makunja and I'm the C++ CMake and cross-platform product manager for both Visual Studio and VS Code and I'm with Alexandra Kemper, and I'm the PM for the C++ extension in VS Code. So before we get started, if you haven't had a chance to already this week, um, we'd greatly recommend you take our survey. It only takes a few minutes to fill out, and it really helps us shape the future of these products. Um, we build these products for you, the C++ developers, so um, any sort of input you have for us is greatly appreciated, and we really take that seriously. Um, also, we're going to be active through the end of the week on the Visual Studio Discord channel. So um, you can meet us, ask any questions that you didn't get a chance to ask us this week, and we can discuss um, anything else that may be top of mind. But our agenda for today is just to reintroduce um, what VS Code is, how it works, um, how to get configured with it, and then show off some of the exciting new features we have for getting started with C++ and CMake quicker than ever. So you can get to that first line of code quicker than ever and um, avoid all that frustration that can come with that sometimes. Then we're gonna show off um, a larger repo and how you can have more like advanced debugging and testing scenarios and um, navigate those more complex C++ repositories and be very productive with them. And then um, we'll wrap up with anything else that's new in VS Code that we didn't get to cover. Um, so from like remote development to make files and everything in between. So um, before we get started, um, let's talk VS Code. VS Code is open source, free, um, and it's really awesome because it can work on any OS. So you can develop from Mac or Linux or Windows, and there is all sorts of remote development solutions in the extensions that allow you to for example, um, have like SSH connections to your remote machines or um, remote tunnels to your remote machines or WSL support. So any sort of remote development needs, VS Code has that, an extension probably for that. Additionally, you can have extensions for any sort of like multi-language support you may need. So as C++ developers, we're gonna have those like C++ and CMake tools extensions. But if you are developing with Python and TypeScript, you can sort of uh, customize your VS Code to have whatever sort of workflows you need um, through these extensions. So it makes it really lightweight, highly customizable, and um, there's IntelliSense built into it. So you're able to, for example, like with C++, you don't need to think about all those like different syntax things that you need to do or adding that semicolon. It sort of does a lot of that work for you so you can focus on your task at hand. Today's talk is only on VS Code, which is that lightweight code editor I just described. If you're interested in Visual Studio, which is that like fully integrated debugging and build suite, um, we had a great talk on that on Tuesday by David and Miriam. It was called What's New in Visual Studio. So if you missed that, I would highly recommend you check it out. But today we're just gonna be covering VS Code. So just wanna set that um, before we get into it. But now that we sort of understand what extensions are, what extensions do I need as a C++ developer? We highly recommend you download the C++ tools and CMake tools extensions. Those are what's gonna provide you that like rich uh, C++ language support, all these new features that you see, um, and sort of like the C++ specific IntelliSense and features for building and debugging. But some other extensions we'll talk about and cover include the GitHub Copilot extension, the Python extension, Makefile tools, and then remote development. So for any sort of other needs that you may have as a C++ developer, there's probably an extension for that. But with that all being said, I'm gonna pass it off to Alex to sort of talk to you about all the great new features we have for getting started with C++. Yes, okay. So hello, or in this case, hello again. And before you say, oh my God, I know what hello world is, yes, yes. But there's been two major focus areas for the last year. 
One of them is advanced debugging and testing, which we're going to go over in a minute. Hold your horses. And the other one is the whole getting started experience, both if you're just a new developer, if you don't know what anything is, or you already know what you want and you're just trying to get started faster and get your code running faster because you want to just make sure some things are working correctly. So um, this is where, as we know, there are a bunch of fundamental components you need to develop in C++, compiler, debugger, build system, and you need to figure out how to individually install these, but then the biggest step is also whatever IDE you're working with, you need to somehow configure these to work with that IDE. And this is where a lot of problems can arise. So uh, in the whole area of building features for people who are trying to get started, we've really tried to focus on configuration and how you can figure out, am I configured? How do I get configured? Um, how do I change my configuration? And things like that. And if any of the items here look unfamiliar, there is a talk tomorrow by our colleague Michael Price. I believe he's in the audience. And it's for, on the Back to the Basics talk. So if any of these compilers look unfamiliar, this is a really great talk for you to visit to learn some of those basics. But so. Um, but so this is where we really focused on getting, figuring out how you're configured, what you're doing, but also how to get you more productive once you are configured. And this is where AI comes in. And, the, and yeah, this is where GitHub Copilot, which is one of the extensions that Sino mentioned a second ago, a second ago, works as an AI pair programmer. And it can do a lot of things for you. And, GitHub Copilot is the one that is like inline suggestions, where it's like the gray suggestions, which we'll show you in a second in a demo. Um, it can give you suggestions of what code to write. It can convert comments to code. It can give uh, create unit tests for you. And it also has an extension for GitHub Copilot chat. Just to note, these are two separate extensions. Um, and they do slightly different things, which I'll also show you in the demo. And where GitHub Copilot really shines is also in repetitive tasks because it can sense, hey, you're trying to create all of these different, um, all of these different functions. You're, for example, trying to create a calculator. You're going to have a lot of different additions and subtractions and um, multiplication functions. And so it can predict what you're going to do. And that's where it can really help you get faster by taking all of the day-to-day -day little tasks away from you and help you just make decisions. And then it'll actually do the menial work. So before we get into the live demo, there is one feature I did have pre-recorded for you. So let me move on here and pause this for a second. And that's, um, we have had a lot of users come to us, especially students who say, what is a compiler? What compilers exist? Why can't you just give me a compiler? I don't know how to install a compiler. What is a command line? This is super confusing. And I understand that in this room, maybe everyone says, oh, but I know how to use a command line. When you're new to C++, this can be overwhelming. So that's why we built a feature called, um, for compiler acquisition. So on a Linux machine, we will install GCC for you, or from, on a Mac, we'll install Clank for you through the command line when you just have to press um, one button. And so this is uh, this feature is being released in our next release. Um, so that's why it's currently in preview. Um, but I have also pre-recorded this because it does take about eight and a half minutes to install Clang, and I thought I would save us the time from having to sit here for that. So. Let's get started. So you just have VS Code open. You open something called the configuration uh, quick pick. So you just say, I want to configure IntelliSense. And if you don't have any compilers available there, I'll talk about this feature more. This is also new. You just say, hey, I want to install. Yep, install compiler for me. This is a Mac machine. So it's just going to run the command for you in the command line. You put in your password and say, yep, install. and. This is where the video magic is going to help us a bit. And magically, wow, Clang is just installed in under one minute. So if only this was real life, this would be very nice. So yep. And wow, software is installed. Amazing. So now, and so that feature is coming out um, with our next release. And now that we technically have a compiler installed in our machine, I'm going to switch to our actual computer here, which is a Windows machine. So if we escape and there's no video. What do you mean? What do you mean there's no video? Wait, one second. No. Sorry. Technical difficulties. Hold on for 10 seconds. Okay. Wait. Why isn't it? Well, we can just maybe show the pre recording. Wait, why isn't it? Sure. You might have just shown uh, our slides and not. 
Oh no. But wait. Wait, it's not even letting me share the slides at this point. Okay, major technical difficulties. Please continue holding on. Um, isn't there someone here who is supposed to be helping us? Um, he seems to be on a lunch break. Okay, that's not helpful. Okay, I also cannot share the slides anymore. So let's, uh, that's not great. Okay, everything's frozen. That's also not great. Um, hmm. So we do have a recording in our slides. Um, we also, I'm, hmm, I, we prepared for every scenario, but not this one, so. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, the entire thing is just frozen. Perfect. Well, we have a lot of cool features to show you, and we're gonna show you how Copilot actually works to create a workspace for you. So this is, uh, oh, no, it's, it's shared literally. through the machine back there. Um, What? Yeah, I don't want to waste everyone's time. Yeah, the problem is that everything is shared through the machine to our screen, so this is the one scenario we did not prepare for. So, um, yes, I've, could you I've please aware, try? I'm aware of the text problem. Okay, okay, that would be you. wonderful. Um, in the meantime, I guess I can talk you through what we're going to show you in the demo. Yeah. Um, so there's, there is GitHub Copilot. Um, which, okay, the big thing with GitHub Copilot that's super confusing is there are two extensions. There's GitHub Copilot and GitHub Copilot Chat. And Copilot is all the inline suggestions, and GitHub Copilot Chat is an extra extension which has like a chat interface similar, similar to ChatGPT. Oh, yes, hello. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Okay, well. GitHub Copilot Chat is an entire chat interface, which you might be familiar with, with like ChatGPT. And so that's actually integrated in Visual Studio Code, so you'll see in a minute there's like a whole sidebar where you can just write a command and just work with ChatGPT directly. Just keep talking. Okay. <laughs> I will, okay, then I will keep going. I'm just gonna lean this way. And, um, Do you plug and plug back yeah, in? Yeah, I did Yeah, that. we unplugged them back in. It's always the unexpected, I swear. Oh, you know? huh. And now everything's black, so uh, this is, there's a cursor? Yeah. It was? Well, okay. Okay, Yay. wait, oh. yes, yes, okay. yes. Okay, wait, so we have, wait, we have movement here. Okay, now we just have to, yes, yes. yeah, woo! Oh my God. <laughs> It was, it's, it was all on the morale, you know, that's, that fixed <laughs> this it. This was planned. <laughs> oh my God, the things you can't imagine. Okay. Um, okay, let me, one second, recollect. Okay, so now, we are in VS Code. You guys already know there's Copilot and Copilot Chat, and so what we're just gonna do is just dive immediately into Copilot Chat, because what I sh as I uh, explained to you here, it's like a sidebar on the side, you can just message with people, and one of the cool, cool things they've done is GitHub Copilot Chat, um, it was in public beta before, but only available for enterprise users. And as of last week, it's available for individuals, so you can actually sign up to use this yourself. And in um, and besides, this is where you can type anything like you would for ChatGPT. Um, but I, they specifically also added commands for Copilot Chat. So for example, they have create workspace, which can just set up your whole project for you. And this is the whole, wow, you can set up a whole project much faster. So if I say like, up. Oh, create a hello world see big project for me. See, you could just use the command, create a workspace, describe that workspace, and Copilot Chat will say, oh, is this what you're looking for? And it'll give you a layout of what the different files would be. Um, it will tell you what the CBIG lists looks like and like what made.cpp would look like. And you could say, yep, this looks great to me, and create the workspace. And this is just the destination. And so while that's creating, this is of course just a hello world example for CBake, but you could do much more complicated things if you start describing what you need. And when you go a little bit into like prop engineering of how well can you describe what you want, and Copilot will meet you there. So our project's created. We have our bay.cpp file. And um, this is where it's also important to remember it's an AI pair programmer, and uh, sometimes you disagree with your pair programmer, and that's okay. So for example, I would not say standard out end line. I would say, oh, like dash end here, and this is where it's important to always review what you ask AI to do, and not just take it 
uh, for one. So now we have a folder set up. We could technically run this. This would be fine to go. But we've added another, a couple of other features. So for example, with the C++ extension, we've added the C++ walkthrough. So whoops, that was not correct. And this walkthrough is really helpful for if we go down to the C++ one, it's really helpful to get you configured. So for example, it can help you um, set up your C++ environment. This is where it really comes in. If you don't know what a compiler is and you don't know how to install one, it can help you. It, can, uh, it has this really helpful quick pick for configuring IntelliSense. You can get inline suggestions. And rather than having to actually go to the configurations, try and figure out which compiler you want to use. And then uh, figure out where the actual path is and put that in your configurations. You now just have like an easy drop down that tells you here's all the compilers we found on your machine. Which one would you like to configure? And that's also where that handy help me install compiler command is that I showed you earlier that will just install compiler for you in case you don't have any options in this list. So it will select a default compiler. You can uh, create a file, launch this file, run a debug, and do this in a couple easy steps. So that's where the walkthrough is really helpful. And if you, since we now have created a folder and we have gotten configured through the walkthrough, we can now I take a look at some of the other configuration features we have, and for this I'm going to have to zoom out. Bear with me, because on the bottom right here, since we now have configured IntelliSense right by selecting our compiler for it, we have this little icon here, which is two uh, squiggly marks, and this is a, the language status bar, and it can tell you have you configured IntelliSense? And if not, it can redirect you to the Quick Break to tell you the, these are all your options to configure IntelliSense. It can tell you what the status is of your current workspace. And you can just run code analysis directly here from the status bar. You can even pin this if you want to using these little icons. Um, and so you can just run code analysis from your actual status bar if you would like to. So that's another feature we've added. And then zooming back in for readability, um, we have also, we have also um, added one of our biggest features, which is in our GitHub, we always get a lot of requests and we are really trying to work our way through all those features. And the biggest one was create declaration definition. So now we've added the ability that if you create a declaration, we will generate the definition for you in the relevant source file. So let's see this in action. So if I create, for example, uh, my class dot H, right, we have and I just create a simple class here. Oops, pardon my spelling. Right, this is where also if we start defining different items. Um, Copilot. So this is where this is not Copilot chat. This is the Copilot extension. It will make inline suggestion for us of saying, hey, people who usually define a class that need a constructor, they probably have some sort of function they want to create. And this is where if I, for example, want to create the calculator we talked about earlier, you could just define a function. So if I want to add two numbers, you could define a function. And even though the source file does not exist yet, I just have a header, I could say, oh, create the definition of add in the source file, and it will generate the source file for me and correctly link them together. In the same way, if I now add a definition here, it will add it to my header file for me. So. Uh, we do my class subtraction. Yep, this is where Copilot's like, I've seen this one before, I know what you're trying to do, okay? Um, and we now move over, yep, create a declaration of subtraction in my class.h. And this is really cool where if you start adding a lot of different functions, so you start with a header file, you have all these different functions, it creates the functions in the same order in the source file as you have in the header file. And if these files already exist, it finds the file for you and adds it in what the closest uh, location it can find. So this is really helpful where you start a project, you create a header file, create a bunch of declarations, and then just say, yep, create all these definitions for me. I don't have to manually make sure that all the parameters are correct, make sure they're all in the same order and uh, everything like that. So yeah, so these are some of the biggest features we've added in terms of getting started and getting your project started. So now let's recap these really quickly and smoothly go back to the slides. So crossed figures, okay. Oh, good, good, we're fine. So. Here, okay, this is where 
we've installed a compiler, we've gone through the demo, yep. So really quickly recapping what we just went through, we added a walkthrough to help you get started. It can help you even install a compiler if you want. And it has a play button integrated to just run your code from a single file. And uh, we ha now have the option to show you all of your configuration options for Intel configuration options for IntelliSense in one go. Um, so you don't need to enter those yourself under configurations. And we have a one click compiler installation experience for anyone who does not want to do this themselves with the command line. And yeah, the, here are some of the features. I did not mention all of these in the demo um, because we added create declaration definition. As I showed to you, the language status bar to show you what your current um, configuration status is and with all these individual items, you can now pin to the bottom status bar. And then we've added a lot of enhancements. And I was, we, are, we do not have time to go through all the like minor enhancements we've added. So two that I wanted to call out is that we've added Markdown comment support. Last year we added DocStream comment support, so then we got a lot of kind of issues of people saying, what about Markdown? I use Markdown, what do I, what do, I do? So we've added Markdown comment support, not to worry. And we've also added recursive macro expansion. You might, you might have already heard about this feature in the Visual Studio talk on Tuesday. And uh, recursive macro expansion is just if you define two macros that call on each other, and then you hover over it in VS Code, we will actually show you what those macros expand to and the fact that they do call each other so um, that you are not caught off guard when suddenly they're referencing each other and you were unaware. So it was just one of the enhancements. And this wraps up all of our getting started work with trying to run your code faster. But we've also looked a lot at advanced testing and debugging. So See them take the lead on this. Yes, so um, now that we are configured with C++, we've run our first files, we're um, all uh, set up. Um, we are now jumping into a larger repo and showing off some of the really great enhancements we have for advanced testing and debugging scenarios. And for this, we're gonna be using Endless Sky. What Endless Sky is, is it is a game that you can see that was developed open source with C++ and CMake. So we'd really like to thank the developers of Endless Sky for developing this game and making it open source so that anyone in the community can access it and play around with it. Um, I know me and Alex had a lot of fun playing around with it for this demo, but um, yeah, I think it really shows the power of VS Code and how you can use it to not only run these games and build these games, but also debug advanced scenarios with this. So um, as you can see, the game has a little bit of like graphics and since it has some like input output, um, there's like game vectors involved. So um, there are package dependencies in this game. And so for this, um, the Endless Sky game is actually bundled with VC package integration for Windows. So um, you don't have to go and it does have all those package dependencies, but it has a, actually a VC package manifest file that manually describes like all the different packages that you have and um, therefore every time I invoke CMake and am trying to configure it, it automatically installs the correct versions of the packages for my machine so I don't have to spend any time, you know, manually installing and making sure I have the right versions of those packages in Windows. Um, it's all automatically done for me. Um, VC package is really great because it is this like free open source C++ pack man package manager and it does work on all platforms build systems and it integrates really well with CMake so you really have to do minimal line adjustments to get it to integrate into your CMake which we'll take a look at um, and it is the largest catalog of open source libraries of any C++ package manager but you're also able if you have your own libraries you maintain to plug those into VC package and it will do all that package management for you. So if you are interested in learning more about a VC package, you can check out aka.ms slash VC package to learn more. Um, but now that we have our packages all managed with VC package, um, when you're working in these larger repositories, you may be working with multiple people out of like one repository and people are doing different sorts of tasks and maybe they don't wanna spend all the time spinning up a developer environment and you know, doing all the things that Alex showed. And so for that, we really uh, would like to highlight GitHub Codespaces. What GitHub Codespaces is, it's, it's that instant developer environment. It's hosted on the GitHub cloud. It's a Linux-based environment and the UI is VS Code, so it's very familiar. And you can create it with a few simple clicks um, from GitHub on any repository you have so that you can get up and running. You don't have to spend time, you know, like debug or 
installing your debugger, configuring your debugger. Um, you just have to specify that in your Docker file and it'll automatically do all that work behind the scenes to spin up a GitHub code space for you. So anyone collaborating on your repo has that like instant developer environment. And um, this can be really great when you're working with a lot of people or even working on your own sort of like project. Um, and you can always learn more about code spaces at aka.ms slash code spaces as well. But now that we sort of set the context of a few things we're gonna see, um, I'd love to show you all the new features we have for um, debugging in VS Code. So what I'll do is I'm just gonna navigate over to um, our VS Code instance. So to set the context, we have um, Endless Sky here, um, a version of Endless Sky here. And there is an error glaring at me. I was told to fix this error glaring at me in my CMake lists um, and get it building and running on Windows. So just to take a step back, I wanted to show you the vcpackage.json file. And this is where in a simple JSON file, I'm able to see like all the different library dependencies and those are gonna get invoked again anytime I call CMake configure from VS Code. So it's really awesome that that's like all managed. I don't have to spend any time managing my libraries, which is really great. Um, and along the bottom, I can see that like all the different CMake configuration things for me. So I'm using MinGW. Um, my target is that full endless sky executable and all the different sort of like CMake presets. So um, now I need to fix the bug that is glaring me in the face. So um, it says the configure failed and would you like to attempt to configure with the CMake debugger? Um, we're really excited to announce that there is a new CMake debugger that we have developed in both VS Code but Visual Studio. And um, in these larger repos, you know, your CMake list.txt files can often be, you know, hundreds and hundreds of lines. And this really helps you debug your CMake list.txt files just like you would any other like C++ file with that uh, debugging interface that's really native to you in VS Code. So for example, to sort of show how it works, um, I can set a breakpoint on that first like red I'm seeing. Um, it's saying I can't specify link libraries for endless sky and I can press debug and that's gonna launch that like debugging interface and I can sort of view my CMake variables like I would any other you know, C++ debugging interface. I can view, set watches on variables, I can view my call stacks and I can set breakpoints all from there. So, uh, so now that it's configured, um, up here I can see that like all the different things I can do, but for simplicity, I'm just gonna zoom in um, and expand that and we're only gonna look at variables right now. So I'm looking for a target called Endless Sky and I can see all my CMake targets here. So all of these look good. These are all my continuous targets and experimental targets, but I notice that Endless Sky is missing from here. Um, if I scroll down more, I see that there's this Win32 executable, which is really weird because actually above here, in ES underscore app name, I'm trying to set that CMake or that endless sky target. So um, what I can do is I can scroll over to my local variables and see the state of all my local variables um, being declared from my CMake lists. And I can see, for example, if I scroll all the way down, I have ES underscore app underscore name. So um, this can be really helpful, again, when you have these large CMake lists.txt files to have this view into what's going on, um, the state of all my variables, especially when you know these are often hundreds of lines long and you can use this like you would any other debugger. So we're really excited about that. So what I'll do is I'll just fix that. Um, I will save and fire off another build, but in the interest of time, I'm just gonna go over here and with the build already run, the bug already fixed and we're just going to um, see that the build has been fixed. Um, I have the proper variable name here. And so now that the build has run and everything, I wanna make sure that I can run this game on Windows. So what I can do is I have this endless guy target now and I will just press play to launch the game. And we can see that I'm able, and apologies for the lighting, um, but we can see that the Endless Sky game is able to be run from VS Code on Windows from my laptop, which is really awesome. I'm able to like interact with it. I can start the game. I can go forward. I can turn around and do loop-de-loops. And it looks like everything is running fine on my end. So um, everything looks good. I will exit out of the game. I think my work here is done. So um, because I'm working with 
Alex, not Alexandra in this scenario, I actually want her to run a quick unit test on this and make sure that, you know, everything is working on her end now that I've built it and ran it. So um, what can be really helpful for defining these things that you may do is you can um, define tasks. So how you define tasks is you type tasks, configure tasks, and here you have all the different CMake tasks you can configure. So if you have any sort of common actions you do in CMake, you can specify those in a tasks.json. And that way, if you're like repetitively doing anything or if I'm working with someone else and I don't want her to have to dive into like CMake and how it works, I can just define a task. And so for example, here I have this CMake build task all templated out for me. And I don't want her to have to go through the process of building all of Endless Guide. That's not really in her scope of work. So I'm just gonna define um, the endless sky tests target. So I'll just type this here. And I'm gonna set up a GitHub code space for her so she can just work on this automatically. So um, the preset she'll be using is a Linux debug because the code space is a Linux based environment. Um, and so I can just commit this up to the GitHub repository and she can create a code space and run that task for me and then from that, it will build the test executables and then it, she'll be able to run those unit tests very easily from um, CMake. Um, before we go over to the code space, I already set up her dev container files, but if I wanted to set them up again, I would just type in add dev container configuration files. And um, it would skeleton this all out for me, but in the interest of time, I just already did um, the work. All I've done is added extra extensions that I want her to have. So, Alex does testing. Alex works primarily with Python, actually. So I'm going to have added the Python extension. So she also has that Python support in there. But I also added, you know, the C++ tools, the CMake tools, and like the remote containers and Docker extensions. So she has that um, all available in her code space. Then in the Docker file, I have, um, all I added was like making sure she has G++, CMake, and Ninja. So that already downloads when she opens the code space. She doesn't have to deal with configuring that all. And then all the library dependencies um, from Debian. So she's able to do that automatically from a code space. So I'm gonna pass it off to Alex now and have her run that task, have her run that task and that test and let me know the output. Hello, hello. So I am now Alex. I am on my own machine. I've never seen, I've never, this is not in this <laughs> laptop. And I am suddenly a Python developer who doesn't really know a lot of C++. So if we dive into that, uh, Sita said she was like running into some bugs with you to, like she was trying to get me to run some tests for her to make sure everything's working correctly. And she made a code space. So let's first going to the Endless Sky repo, finding her fork. Okay, I see she has some code spaces available. Let's just open those. And this is where the speed of opening up the code space is related to your Wi-Fi. So it might take a second, bear with us, but it is working, so um, that's why. So this is opening a code space, and code spaces are always Linux environments. So I will simultaneously be testing for her, not just her unit test, but also making sure that all of the changes she's made to end the sky potentially also work in a Linux environment. So, okay, we have our, excuse me, we have our task.json, and now we are hopefully loading all of our files. Okay, shape, shape. <laughs> But so, okay, we have our files. To me, this is a new repo. This is where I could use some of the new features. We've released the C++ extension to try and navigate this repo more effectively. And so an example of that would be, oh, okay. Yes, it is prompting me to put, uh, to put in my GitHub credentials. We are going to skip this, which is going to make GitHub very angry just because this requires a little bit more time than what we have today. So uh, we're going to cancel that, but normally you should definitely sign it to GitHub so you can submit PRs. So if we go to our actual code, um, you can start, wow, this is a lot of C++. As a Python developer, this is very overwhelming. Um, to try and start figuring out what code do we have, wait, let me close this really quick. 
uh, I'm going, this is where one of our new features we've added is call hierarchy. So this kind of goes hand in hand with the create declaration definition. If you've made a bunch of different functions, you can now right click on that function and say show call hierarchy. And it will load all the incoming or outgoing calls and you can toggle this using the little phone icon on the top over here. And so for example, if I wanted to start taking apart what's going on here, what functions are we using, I can see all of the different references and within these references then call show incoming or outgoing calls of the nodes of the function that I've seen. So this would make navigating way easier. And uh, if I start understanding what's happening, I also can see there are a couple of Python files, I believe, which I'm very interested in and much more interested than C++ as a Python developer. And this is where we're gonna have to zoom out a little bit to see it. Um, on the right here, you can see when I open a Python file, on the bottom right, the language has now switched to Python because it's identified as a Python file. So that's using the Python extension that CDEM added for me. And if you re remember, the squiggly lines are a language status bar, but because this is Python now, it doesn't have the same uh, features in, a, in the language status bar as C++ did. So here I can change type setting, uh, change type checking, which as a Python developer would be much more interesting. And also if I make any, uh, changes now in Telesense will be uh, Python specific recommendations rather than C++ or uh, just generic tag parser recommendations. So, but now, okay. Assuming I've now looked through the code base, I've gotten more familiar, I, we gotta get back to the task at hand, which is as he was talking about running some sort of tests. And this is where we could use uh, we see there are some tests, but first what we need to do is actually build these tests. And so she said she created a task for me. So if I say run task in the command prompt, yep, there we see it. We have CMake build task. And so this is only going to build the tests for me, which should hopefully be very fast compared to building the full game. And yep, that was almost instantaneous. So that's great to see. And here also I will zoom back in for everyone so it's more readable. And so we have now built the tests. And if I now go through, we have the uh, integration tests available here, and we can actually take a look at all of those. So if we navigate to the test explorer, this is a new feature we've also added, where you could actually see all your tests in one go on the left. You can run them individually, you can navigate to them. So here is an example of all the integration tests available with extended sky. But she said something about unit tests, so we're gonna go to the unit tests. Ah, and there's the unit test she wants me to run. So with the test explorer, you can navigate to the individual test, take a look of what it actually does, if there's any issues with it, and then just run that test. Yep, and so for me, it passed. So for me, this is a really good sign that whatever issues she was running into have been fixed. It works on a Linux machine, and it's good to go. And this way, I have not had to deal with this at all on my own local machine. I could just run her code, see what's happening, and get back to my own work. So with that, Passing it back to see them. All right, thank you very much. Um, so we went over a lot. So let's just quickly summarize all the, oh, all the, oopsies, not that. This command, oh, not that either. One second. Um, all the features that we covered. So um, we have a lot of new debugging and testing features for CMake, and so that first one is that CMake debugger, and we're really excited to bring that to the CMake community so that they can be more empowered to work with CMake and understand their CMake lists. This was developed on a really solid foundation and committed up to Kitware, so we're really excited. Um, if you want are interested in any of the technical details of that, it's all available open source in Kitware CMake repository, so you can check that out, but it allows you to debug your CMake scripts using the VS Code debugging interface that you would use for any other um, project. So, very excited about that. And as Alex showed, we also have a test explorer. So in, for all of your test presets with CMake, you're able to dynamically see what kind of tests you have configured, um, run any sort of batch of tests, navigate to them, um, and it's all in one simple view. So this can be really useful when you're working with these larger projects and you have a lot of tests that you may need to run. It helps you sort of see that from one view. So instead of having to go through the terminal or command line. 
So we're really excited about that. Um, we also have some features that improve your day-to-day C++ productivity. So there was that call hierarchy feature that Alex showed that sh- shows all the incoming and outgoing calls to functions. And we're really excited to um, deliver that to the C++ community as well. This was one of our highly upvoted tickets. So um, this was directly from customer feedback and customer requests. So we're really excited about that. And we also have CMake tasks that allow you to define any common tasks that you may run um, in a task.json file. So therefore you can just sort of like have it all skeletoned out for you and run them whenever you need to, for example, run a CMake build or run a CMake clean. And uh, you don't have to always have to configure exactly what you're trying to do. So with all of that, those are all our new features that we showed off for C++ and CMake specifically extensions. But um, as we see, sometimes when you're working in these larger repos, you will have to deal with multiple languages. And this is where VS Code is really awesome because you can download the extensions of your choice and seamlessly navigate between, for example, your .cpp files and your .py files and have those specific uh, language-specific features for each. So, for example, the language-specific language status bar um, where we can run code analysis in C++ but um, do other things like type checking in Python. So you can just download the extension of your choice. It's extremely lightweight, and you'll have all those language-specific IntelliSense and features from one place. So you don't have to context switch between like what is the syntax for C++ versus what is the syntax for Python. Um, also, when you're working with multiple languages, we have Jupyter Notebooks. And what Jupyter Notebooks are is they allow you to define um, like executable scripts. And so, for example, you can have different languages exist in one Python or Jupyter notebook. And so you can, for example, have Python define um, like loading a data frame, but then SQL querying that data frame and all in one notebook. So you can work with, you know, whatever language that you're more comfortable with for different kinds of scripts and invoke them um, on their own. So with all of that, um, we covered a lot, but we actually have a lot of other exciting things um, in VS Code that we didn't get to talk about. And so I'll pass it off to Alex to round that all out. Because surprisingly, there are more extensions of VS Code than just C++ and CMake. Uh, we actually, there are a lot of different ones that are organized by the VS Code, uh, VS Code core team. And so they've been doing a lot of work, especially around uh, remote development and how to make this more pro- like seamless and easy to use. But so let's just go through like a number of extensions, what they're doing, if they're new, what they're up to. And so the first one is going to be a little familiar because we have mentioned code spaces uh, during this talk. And we even showed you one of them. If you want to learn more, Michael Price, the one who's giving the talk tomorrow, he did have a talk last year about code spaces. So if you want to learn more, that's uh, all the details of a code space are defined there. But in terms of updates, Code spaces have added something called templates in the last year. So you can now just create a Rust template, for example, or a Ruby on Rails uh, code space. And they've done a lot of improvements under the hood. So they have upped, uh, there is a free tier and a premium tier for code spaces. And for the free tier, you can now use 60 hours a month as a free user. And you can use 180 hours a month of a code space as a paid user. So those, they've upped those limits, which include uh, storage limit improvements. And they've also done a lot of improvements to their own machines under the hood. So now that four core machines will have twice the number of uh, amount of RAM and 30% more CPU performance, which just makes your code run way faster. And if this is where if you're looking to run your code in the cloud and have a remote machine that's really, really powerful, it has, a, has access to a lot of scalable resources. This is where CodeSpace is really convenient. And they've also made a lot of access management changes. So as an enterprise, you can now control how many code spaces people can create. Um, so you know how much you will be charged. You could also have individual people have code spaces, not just enterprises. And you could share your code space with someone outside your company. So if, for example, you're working with a client, you just managed to get a proof of concept working and you want to send them uh, want to send them the code so they can take a look. You could just share a code space with them. And even though they're outside of your organization, they can just open it, see what's happening, run the code. And for example, with a build task, and then um, they're good to go. So that's doing code spaces. And then if you are working in a remote environment, but the whole idea of connected to Azure or using the cloud is not your preferred way. There are also now remote tunnels. 
And this is a way to securely connect to a remote machine without having to use SSH. It does all the SSH connecting for you. And so it just creates a secure tunnel between you and that other machine. And there's been a lot of development to make this available, not just in the VS Code desktop, but also VS Code.dev, so the online version of VS Code, also with the um, CLI available in VS Code desktop, so you don't even need to open the desktop. I can just create tunnels through the CLI, and you can just open, uh, create a tunnel, open a tunnel, and um, then you already have the secure connection established. All you need to do is log in through um, M360, uh, M365 account or through GitHub, and you're good to go. So that saves you a lot of hassle. Also, for any of the extensions I talk about, uh, there's more information you can obviously find at all of the links that are at the bottom right, so in the yellow, so aka.ms aka slash whatever the extension name is, so in this case, remote tunnels. And so we have, we have remote development in the cloud, we have remote tunnels, we also have dev containers, which I believe some of you have heard before, I think I talked to someone earlier this week about this, where you can now open folders in uh, with a Docker container and just create full feature development environment. So these are also helpful if you have really large, complicated code bases that you want to share with team members or you want to just decouple them from your local machine because you don't want, you want to do some upgrades, you want to make sure it doesn't break all your code. And uh, so these are really powerful and easy to create. And one of the features I really like that they've added is that you could just you could just say it's the third command down which says open folder in container. So if you already have a folder open, you say, oh, I want this to be in this specific container. You just click that and it does all the work behind the scenes for you to create the container and just reopens it in VS Code as if nothing's changed, but now you're in a container. So that's really helpful. And then for the VS Code core team, they've also been helping you um, separate the different work you do. So they've added something called profiles. And profiles are really helpful if you do uh, work in different contexts because it's a profile is pretty much just a selection of different settings and configurations and UI preferences like light versus dark theme and for these you can now have a different profile for each so if you have a school account and a work account and you have a specific uh, project you're working on and you just want a different set of configurations for each of them you could just make a new profile it's really easy through the little uh, account icon at the bottom left. You can just say, yep, add a new profile and whatever configurations you set for that profile uh, will apply and you can just easily switch between them rather than having to reconfigure everything every time you go, uh, you go home or you start working on a different project. And then finally, uh, something that might be interesting is we have the Makefile Tools extension. And this is where this whole presentation, we've been talking about CMake and what CMake can do. But if you would like to use some, a, a different build system than CMake, Makefile Tools is a great resource uh, because it could also just build, debug, and run your make targets. And it works really closely with the C++ extension. So with the dropdown I showed you earlier, if you want to configure IntelliSense, and you could just choose your compiler, one of the options there is if you have CMake configured, for example, or you have Makefile tools configured, you can just select that extension and say, hey, just use the same configuration for IntelliSense. And uh, you don't need to do everything from scratch again. And also we've added uh, support for C23 in Makefile tools. And we've added macros uh, for settings in Makefile. So you could just say, for example, workspace folder, rather than having to type out the whole path to your whatever file you're trying to access, or whatever folder you're trying to access. So we now support macros in settings.json. And for the actual extension, if you open it, there's a sidebar that tells you whether you're configured or whether you your build targets have been found. We've added two items there, which can tell you whether your make file has been identified and whether make.exe has been found on your machine, and if so, where it's been found. So those are the updates for make file tools. And now that wraps up here are a couple of different extensions. This is what they do. And uh, however, we are continuously iterating, continuously building new features. So let's talk about the future. And this is where CW can take over again. Yeah, so this is our plug that uh, both the C++ and CMake tools extensions are developed open source on GitHub. You can access them via the aka.ms links for each um, extension. Um, and a lot of the work we do is for you, the C++ developers, and comes from your ideas. So we would greatly appreciate if you create GitHub issues on things you want to see or upvote anything you want to see. 
and it really helps us um, with our backlogs or but some things we have up created in our backlogs and are highly upvoted um, include a lot of improvements to the refactoring experience on the C++ side. So for example, extract to function, member function, signature editing, generating overrides for virtual functions and adding any missing includes to your files. We're also gonna be working on general performance improvements. Um, and so for example, IntelliSense generation so that you can get to coding and creating your code faster than ever. Um, on the CMake tools side, some of our highly requested items include having like a new fully customizable sidebar with both CMake tasks and presets integrated into it. So you're able to have um, a dynamic UI. Adding CMake preset support for the new Kitware um, workflow and package presets, so you can invoke those from VS Code. Having automated CMake installation, so um, that configuration um, of acquiring a build system is also automated, and language services for CMake. So hopefully next year we'll be able to show off some of these exciting features or um, anything you request from us. So we would greatly appreciate if you check out our GitHubs and um, interact with us. Other than that, I know it's nearing the end of the week. We have a lot of great sessions this week. So if you missed any of these, please check them out on YouTube. Um, they were all really awesome. And on Friday, we do have that getting started with C++ talk by Michael Price at 1.30. So um, definitely would check that out if you're interested. But other than that, um, this concludes our talk. Please again, take our survey. It really helps us. Um, these are all the ways you can find us. We have our Twitter or X handles. Please note that mine has two underscores um, if it's not visible. You can always contact our team via email for anything you need, and we will be on Discord this week. And please give us uh, feedback through SCED. SCED, I don't know how you say it, but thank you. <laughs>